Armin Navabi has written a book called Why There Is No God. That's quite a claim. You're probably thinking, to prove this claim, he's going to have to have lots of scientific evidence like this. Well, that does look pretty scientific, and drawn from a pretty detailed bibliography, too. Very impressive. Nicely researched. Maybe the guy can pull this off after all. Just one small problem. Those aren't screen captures from Navabi's book. They're screen captures from the book Signature in the Cell, a book which makes a very different claim. In that book, Stephen Meyer sails over waters in which Navabi won't even dip his toe. Meyer makes the claim that DNA was designed, opening the door for a deist hypothesis, and then attempts to back up his claim with scientific evidence, citing dozens upon dozens of peer-reviewed articles to make his case. Still, Navabi does acknowledge the need for evidence. As we see here in this section from his book on Understanding the Burden of Proof, Navabi tells us that during any debate, it is the job of a person making a claim to provide support, evidence, and reasoning for that claim. Very reasonable, but if you know anything about the history of atheist apologist thought, you know that this statement, while true, is surprising coming from Navabi, because typically the burden of proof is to the atheist what sunshine is to a vampire. So is Navabi going to boldly go where no atheist author has gone before? Nope. Turns out that that statement was a bit of a head fake. Just turn the page and you'll gaze upon Navabi's true colors the atheist wolf emerging from the agnostic sheep clothing. On just the very next page, he'll now deny his own statement, reversing his position, and insist, just like every other atheist in the past, that the only people who bear the burden of proof are the people who claim that God exists. As Navabi states, In the case of debates about God, the burden is on the believer to offer support for her position if she wishes it to be considered seriously. In reality, the only necessary argument against believing in God is simply that there is no evidence that any gods exist. An atheist doesn't need to justify her lack of belief any further. Mm, sorry, that's 100% incorrect, and as I noted, it completely contradicts his earlier statement. As Navabi stated on page 10 correctly, the burden of proof actually falls on any person making an affirmative claim. That means that upon those who make the claim, there is no God, the burden of proof likewise falls. In short, both sides, not just one, have the burden of proof. Navabi obviously understands this because he's written a book that purports to justify his position. So when he makes the claim, an atheist doesn't need to justify her lack of belief any further, it raises the logical question, why write the book? Indeed, this latter argument undercuts the rationale of the book completely. Freed of any need to provide evidence, the cover of the book simply makes a claim and then fails to justify it, making a mockery of the title, Why There Is No God. Thought I was going to give you evidence, says Navabi. Fooled you. Read someone else's book. You aren't going to get it here. So the book isn't only missing evidence, it's also missing that all-important asterisk to the right of the title, the asterisk which says, Evidence Not Included. But that's not the worst of it. The entire premise of the book is built on not just one, but two logical fallacies. Here's the title of his book. Now look at the subtitle, Simple Responses to 20 Common Arguments for the Existence of God. Okay, pause your video and see if you can see what the two logical fallacies are. Find them? Here's the first logical fallacy. There's no logical connection between the claim, why there is no God, and a failure of 20 common arguments to prove the existence of God. To quickly see why, imagine a book titled Why Atheism is False, with the subtitle Simple Responses to 20 Common Arguments for Atheism. Suppose the author shows us that these 20 arguments for atheism are bad. Does that mean that atheism is false? Of course not. It just means that the 20 arguments are bad. Atheism remains unscathed, and so too, in this case, will theism, even if Navabi is successful. Even worse, by his own admission, Navabi isn't responding to the best arguments for the existence of God, he's just responding to the most common arguments. But what if all those arguments are bad, and there are 20 other arguments which are excellent? Then the premise of his book is doubly shot. Well, just to let you know, the best arguments for the existence of God revolve around the origin of life from non-life, an event several scientists, including the co-discoverer of DNA, Francis Crick, have referred to as nothing short of miraculous. 
As it turns out, there are well over 30 scientific obstacles to mankind ever being able to provide a scientific explanation. Needless to say, Navabi doesn't touch even one of those 30 scientific obstacles. To see some of those arguments, go to Google or YouTube and type Dawkins, Law, Atheism, and you'll find this video. Not one of those arguments in his book, but any one of them is vastly superior to those he wants to refute. Navabi is so focused on shooting at fish in a barrel on the port side, he can't see Moby Dick bearing down on him from the starboard side. So let's summarize. Navabi isn't going to provide evidence for his position and is only going to respond to the weaker arguments for the existence of God based on two logical fallacies. Hardly off to a sterling start, we've barely got past the cover. Little surprise at Navabi, without evidence, and only some common and not necessarily strong arguments to respond to, abandons ship on page 12, not even 10% into the book. While his title carries the clear implication that we can say with certainty that there is no God, he has to disavow us of that notion pronto. Because of the total lack of credible evidence for his assertion, Navabi is forced to waffle. Take a look at the screen capture, pause the video, and read these paragraphs. When you're done reading, start the video up again, and I'll point out the problem. Right here on page 12, Navabi undercuts the credibility of his own argument, admitting that he can't be absolutely certain that God doesn't exist. But if that's true, why title the book, Why There Is No God? Why not just title it, Why I'm Really, Really Sure, Cross My Fingers and Hope to Die, That There's No God? Sounds like we need another asterisk. The final nail in the coffin for the Navabi non-thesis is that when he actually does get around to trying to undercut his hand-picked straw man arguments, he fails there too. We need look no farther than Navabi's first argument, where, instead of presenting it in all its challenging glory as Meyer does, Navabi presents a watered-down version of the origin of life problem that's much easier to attempt to refute than the evidence-based version found in Meyer's book and also found in the Dawkins Challenge video on YouTube and in many other areas. But he fails even here. Navabi never responds to the origin of life problem directly and only attempts to argue against his dumbed-down version of the problem, saying that even though there are things in the world we don't yet understand and may never truly understand, there's no reason to simply make up an explanation. In effect, according to Navabi, belief in God isn't really an answer. It's simply a way of saying, I don't know. Well, what he's saying is that the hypothesis that a designer is responsible for the creation of life is based on an argument from ignorance. Turns out, though, the opposite's true. The real argument is based on reasoning from knowledge, as these screen captures from Meyer's book reveal. I'll place each screen capture in the video for two seconds each, and when you get to a screen capture, pause the video and read the text, and then allow the video to proceed to the next screen capture. So, as you can see, Navabi starts by attacking a weaker case that no design theorist today would make. There's even more to it than that. As you can see when you read the Dawkins Challenge PDF, the case for the design hypothesis is even stronger than Meyer's summary. The scientific evidence shows that the so-called naturalistic hypothesis may turn out to be scientifically impossible for a wide variety of reasons, providing even more evidence for a design hypothesis than best fit. When your naturalistic hypothesis is scientifically impossible, then what card can you play? Having misstated the abiogenesis position completely, Navabi is free to ignore the evidence and then makes the statement, many scientists have shown that complex systems can arise without a designer. Evolution by natural selection is one such system. There are two problems with this statement. In the first place, even if a scientist were to have shown that one complex system could arise without a designer, that doesn't mean that every complex system can be explained without a designer. The amount of complexity is a key variable that could explain success in one case and failure in another. Furthermore, Navabi's claim about what scientists have shown is false. 
No scientist has ever shown that complex systems on the order of life's complexity can arise without a designer, which is precisely the point of the Dawkins challenge no atheist dare take. For example, if you're claiming that evolution has produced the appearance of design, you haven't shown that no designer is involved because, according to the universal common ancestor hypothesis, all life that exists on Earth today is biologically tied to the very earliest form of life. So until you've explained that earliest form of life, you can't make the statement that no designer was involved. If a designer was involved in the earliest stages, which is exactly the question that we're faced with in the origin of life problem, then his assertion is false. And if Navabi thinks that 21st century science justifies Darwin's 19th century view of evolution, then he clearly hasn't done his homework, as you can see from the screen capture of this website. The Third Way website, which cites over 20 books written by scientists arguing against the simplistic view of evolution by natural selection, tells us that Navabi is way behind the times, which is just a natural consequence of always asking everyone else to furnish the burden of proof instead of doing your own homework. If there's evolution, there's a lot more to it than Darwin's unjustified theory, and once we get a proper understanding of what's actually going on, only then will we be better able to say whether or not the entire system was designed. But if you're going to ignore that evidence, then just how legitimate is your there is no God claim going to be? It's not legitimate at all. It's a castle in the sky, or in the immortal words of Shakespeare, a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. On the same page, Navabi tries a second approach and argues that complex systems can arise without a designer by, of all things, citing as an example a computer game designed by a human being. Now that's rich. When your evidence that complexity can arise without a designer, is a computer game written by a designer, displayed on a monitor whose blueprint was authored by human designers, through the action of computer chips created by human designers, instantiated by an operating system that was a collaborative effort of many human designers and broadcast through an internet conceived of by human designers, then you've achieved a whopping zero on that all-important clue metric. Even more absurdly, this computer game, authored by human designers, is supposed to show us that life can evolve without a designer, but if you look at the examples of this so-called life, all you see is a bunch of dots on a page, something that could only be confused with the real thing by someone with a five-year-old mentality. Oh, look, Mommy, six squares next to each other, that's a toad. Oh, and look, Mommy, five squares next to each other, that's a glider. And oh, look, Mommy, some other squares arranged in a broken-up rectangle. That looks to me like a lightweight spaceship. And here's a roundish one that looks like a beehive. Boy, they really have created life now, haven't they? Strike five, or is that six? Having failed to demonstrate his theory that life can arise without a designer using artificial life, let alone natural life, Navabi then has to rely on the ultimate atheist fallback, well, who created God, the atheist's go-to question when all other arguments are lost. The answer to that one is very simple. Something has to be pre-existent, either God or the universe, and if the universe is not pre-existent, then God is. And if the scientific evidence shows that the only way that life could have emerged on Earth was from some sort of designer, then we're well on our way to establishing the identity and authorship of the life forms on planet Earth, which could not have been the random interaction of natural laws. Finally, we conclude our analysis of Navabi's first chapter by focusing on the extensive research he used to justify it. Did I say extensive? Oops. Meyer had over 40 pages of peer-reviewed research in his book, and all Navabi can muster up is these two quotes, one from an 18th century theologian, the other an article on mathematical games that appeared in Scientific American in 1970. So there you have it, a book not only missing critical evidence, but more than one critical asterisk. And with missing evidence and missing asterisks, it's clear that Navabi has really missed the target. If I were you, I'd miss this one.